Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Politico Live. My name is Bjarke Smithmeyer, and I cover tax uh, at Politico, among other things, which uh, is only fitting because the next panel debate we'll be getting into is the future of uh, global taxation. Uh, we'll touch on many different subjects, such as the OECD talks happening right now, uh, the future of uh, or attempts to try and share the profits of big corporations, and of course, how climate change filters in to all of this. To help me dissect the subject, I have a group of fantastic panelists that I'll introduce in just a second, and I'll ask them each to just give me a wave so that people know who is who. Uh, in no particular order, uh, from the European Commission, uh, I'd like to introduce everyone to Benjamin Angel, who is uh, the Director for Direct Taxation, Tax Coordination, Economic Analysis and Evaluation. Uh, then, uh, from the permanent representation of France to the European Union, I have Claire Chermitinsky, who is Minister Councillor for Economic Affairs, Head of Economic, Financial and Recovery. And last, but definitely not least, from Oxfam, I have Susama Ruiz, who is the Global Tax Lead. Thank you all very much for being here. Uh, now, just before uh, we kick off, uh, I'd like to just give you all a quick reminder. You can submit your questions via the Swap Card app uh, in the question box next to the live stream. Uh, and to join the discussion by answering the poll which we have up and running, which is which tax initiative will be implemented by the end of 2022. You can also tweet about this event with our hashtag Politico competition. And now on to our, our subject. Um, we have the benefit uh, of uh, actual negotiations happening as we speak at the OECD in Paris. Um, there is a bunch, or there are a bunch of global negotiators who are trying to figure out a general agreement that G20 countries can sign off on in a couple of weeks' time. Um, just to give you a very quick reminder, this uh, initiative is made up of two pillars. The first one is, uh, is an attempt to tax the uh, biggest, uh, the, the world's biggest uh, 100 companies and then share those tax uh, profits uh, across the world, or proceeds across the world. And then there is a second pillar, which is uh, an attempt to try and introduce a minimum effective corporate taxation rate of 15%. Um, I think, you know, we may as well start with uh, Benjamin, uh, given the fact that you're at the commission, uh, which I guess has uh, some uh, information that might come in. Uh, what's the latest you, you've heard? Is there anything you can tell us about what's going on inside of the room? Well, nothing is going on inside of the room, primarily because the meeting takes place tomorrow in the first place, Bjork. Um, but what is clear is that there is a, um, a significant effort to do our best to um, close the loose ends. There's still uh, a number of elements which are under discussion. It's a very complex discussion. It's unavoidable. We are uh, clearly setting new standards for the international taxation, and Pillar 2 in particular is truly uh, revolutionary. So it's, it's normal that this uh, discussion takes some time. We got a new impetus uh, coming from the new US administration. Uh, we are trying to build on this impetus, and we are quite confident that there will be uh, a broad agreement on the general parameter in, in Venice, in the G20, um, that we can put the, the missing fine print in time for uh, finalization in October. Thanks. Uh, yeah, no, sure, T tomorrow is the day that they're supposed to come up with something. Uh, of course, there are always backroom uh, discussions as they go along. Um, and, and from the latest information that I've received anyway, is that there are a few European countries uh, who are kind of figuring out whether they want to sign up to the Pillar 2, so the minimum uh, corporate uh, tax rate. Um, but as this thing goes along, we can't really jump into things right now as, as it's moving. I'm, I'm just wondering, um, Benjamin, could you just give me a sense of what the EU implementation timeline would be, assuming that then we get a deal that the G20 countries actually sign off on? Oh. Um... As regards Pillar 1, we have to wait first for the deal to be transformed into a multilateral convention. And, um, and, and, and from this point in time, um, we are uh, examining the possibility of having a new directive to transpose Pillar 1 into the European Union so as to ensure maximum level playing field and to make sure also that we cover all member states because we do have one member state which is not part of the current OECD discussion. For Pillar 2, the calendar uh, is expected to be very quick. 
Uh, Pillar 2 does not require a multilateral convention. It is de facto non-binding. Uh, inclusive framework members are free to uh, subscribe it or not. And since we don't have to wait for a multilateral convention, it means that as soon as there is an international agreement uh, in October and some model legislation being prepared by the OECD, we can move to EU transposition stage. So for Pillar 2, you should expect that the Commission table a draft directive at the beginning of next year. Uh, and uh, we will do our best to build on the uh, considerable impetus that there is at the moment to have a swift adoption. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I, I didn't realize uh, Pillar 2 would be uh, that quick uh, in terms of moving forward. Um, I, I think one of the things that is an interesting debate in terms of Pillar 1, uh, that the discussions have been happening behind closed doors, is you know, whether there should be some exemptions. Uh, the, the United Kingdom, for instance, has been pushing hard for financial institutions to be exempt from uh, the, the, the Pillar 1 tax, uh, and other countries have been pushing to avoid uh, extraction or manufacturing, such as mining, uh, to, to not have to pay the, the tax as well. Uh, Claire, I'm just going to move to you on that. I mean, to what extent is France then happy with this idea of, of introducing some exemptions to, to Pillar 1? Well, first of all, let me say that uh, France uh, is a strong supporter from, from the beginning of the OECD process, and we uh, watch with uh, uh, great pleasure uh, the fact that uh, it is now moving forward quite uh, swiftly, um, and we expect that we will be able to uh, reach a political agreement uh, in July, uh, or in the coming weeks, both on, on SWIFT, on, on model rules on Pillar 2, and also uh, as regards Pillar 1 on abiding multilateral agreements, as was just explained by uh, Benjamin. Um, of course, on Pillar 2, uh, we would like to uh, have the broader uh, possible scope, um, and uh, we, we expect uh, that this will be, uh, of course, one subject for discussion, um, but uh, our objective is clearly to cover as much as possible uh, uh, all sectors of the economy, uh, and this is clearly uh, the starting point for, for France. Um, thank you. Uh, Susanna, I'll, I'll move on to you. Uh, I think that Oxfam have some particular interesting views on, on the way that uh, the OECD discussions are going on. And, you know, is, is this global uh, initiative fair uh, in your view? Well, uh, no. <laughs> As it is, it's, uh, we, can, we can't say it's fair at this uh, moment. Uh, what we've seen is um, it's a big effort. It's uh, not just two years of uh, global negotiations started a long time ago, uh, eight years ago, in fact. And uh, what we were expecting is a real overhaul of the, of the system. What we have on the table is a very limited uh, solution on Pillar 1 on the new redistribution or uh, taxing rights that will leave very, very little profit, uh, new taxing rights for developing countries. And we have a very unfair Pillar 2 uh, that will channel uh, most of the new and uh, additional re revenues to G7 and to European uh, countries. So uh, what we say is that uh, after close to 100 years of unfair tax system, what we'll have on the table is still a system that has some radical ideas and, uh, and a lot of potential on the table, but it's still very unfair for developing countries. So what would you prefer? What is, what, what is the alternative that you think would be far more fair? I think we we need to to we should be thinking at a system that will be redistributing all the global profit for a, a broader uh, scope of uh, company, not just at the top of 100 mega corporations. So that will make uh, the impact in terms of revenues uh, much uh, uh, higher for the, and then the, uh, more revenues to be channeled for developing countries. And definitely on pillar two, what we would like to see is a higher rate and also a more balanced way to distribute those additional revenues, the way the implementation of the, of the Pillar 2 is going to be designed. Because at this moment, it's a top-up system that uh, will give the priority in, tax in, 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 in uh, implementing this minimum tax to rich uh, countries, to those countries that are home of the headquarters of those large companies, so that uh, leaves uh, very little uh, impact for, uh, for developing countries. And overall, the system that will not help uh, ending the race to the bottom and their profit shifting to become a tax haven by, by companies operating in those countries. 
Oh, thank you, Susanna. I'll move it straight back to Claire then. I, well, I mean, what, what's your take? What's your reaction to that? Uh, if if we're, France has been pushing very hard for uh, a fairer way of making sure that global companies, including digital ones, uh, pay their fair share of tax, uh, if this isn't the right way to go, then, then what's your reaction to that? Hmm. Well, of course, uh, things are, can always be improved. My, my initial reaction to that would be to say that um, what we are trying to do with uh, this uh, whole process, Pillar 2 and Pillar 1 together, is to try to have a, a more modern and fairer uh, taxation regime at the international level. What we, what we witness so far is the fact that uh, multilateral companies uh, can find ways to uh, escape uh, uh, general uh, taxation uh, generally uh, through uh, using a specific uh, jurisdiction which um, have a non-cooperative way uh, to uh, devise their uh, fiscal system, their, their taxation system. And, uh, well, this... Uh, this overall negotiation in the OECD and in G20 uh, really uh, makes uh, a huge difference uh, in the way that, uh, first of all, we, uh, we expect that uh, with the application of the implementation of Pillar 2, uh, all big companies pay at least 15% of their taxes and do not use uh, jurisdictions uh, to escape uh, this possibility. And uh, as far as Pillar 1 is concerned, it is a, a huge step forward towards a reallocation of uh, taxing rights amongst countries. So indeed, uh, well, this is the first step. Indeed, uh, it, uh, it has reallocation effects. So we need to, to take care of that to make sure that this reallocation movement is fair and does not deprive uh, uh, poorer countries from the possibility to uh, raise uh, revenues. But I, I would say that the situation from which we are starting is even worse. So mm -hmm. this is, a, again, a first step and it improves the situation overall. Benjamin, what, what do you think? I mean, uh, do you also agree that we just have to start somewhere and then maybe come further with other initiatives later down the line? Yes, I mean, for once, I must disagree with the statement from, uh, from Oxfam. Uh, first, as regards Pillar 1, we will have, uh, it is true, only 100 companies in scope, but those companies are, for most of them, active all over the world in developing countries as well. And I cannot uh, unveil the current discussion, but what I can tell you is that the, the, the nexus that is being discussed, that is uh, the, the minimum turnover needed for those companies uh, to uh, make the, the country in which they are eligible to receive part of the tax uh, taxable base has been lowered spectacularly. Uh, so uh, everyone should be uh, quite happy about pillar one uh, and uh, almost everyone will receive something. As regards pillar two, uh, I don't think the uh, countries which have aggressive tax practices really gain from it. There is today some kind of silly race to the bottom where each time uh, an exotic island uh, goes for a very aggressive rate, the neighboring uh, uh, exotic island feels obliged to go even lower up to the point where uh, they end up with a rate at zero. What is there to gain when they have a rate at zero? This is a, a negative sum game for everyone. By putting a floor to the race to the bottom, it also ensures that those countries will not be put in a situation where they uh, just terminate their own corporate income tax. They will be able to tax normally as they should. Uh, Susanna, I'll give you a chance to respond. <laughs> Thank you. And um, well, it's true that we've been uh, not in disagreement so often with Benjamin, but it's, uh, I think this time it's important to remind that uh, Yes, this, uh, solu I mean, the starting point was worse. We've made it, uh, a well, it's been made a little less worse, but, but in the end, uh, uh, and it's going to have an impact on the very, very aggressive uh, jurisdiction. Some of those exotic uh, islands, as Benjamin was saying, and some others that are having a very, uh, I mean, mechanisms to get uh, 
uh, taxation close to 0%, but nothing else than that. And yes, it's going to have an impact on how some multinational large corporations are using some of those uh, jurisdictions, aggressive jurisdictions, and Cotton Island are some of the closer to, uh, to, to us. Uh, but this is going to be made at the expense of developing countries. And that's the big uh, problem for us in this moment. But we see some steps, but this is far from being the redesign in, in fairness and, 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 and the solution that developing countries uh, were needing. And, and if we are hearing what they are saying these days, uh, it's uh, the, the, the sense of frustration they are having after so big engagement, after so active uh, contribution, uh, as constructive also trying to adopt and, and propose uh, alternatives. Uh, I don't think we can say, not only from Oxfam side, but from, uh, from many developing countries, that we, this will help. Especially also if they have to remove uh, unilateral measures that in some countries have been seen as a way uh, to compensate uh, the, the, the aggressivity of some of those uh, companies operating in the territory. So yes, it's, uh, it's an initial point that is better than nothing. And at this moment, every single dollar or every single euro that will be able to collect is better than nothing, but it's far from being the fair and the redistributive solution that we were waiting for. Thank you uh, for that. Better than nothing, uh, but not good enough. Uh, Clara, I'd like to move to you, given the fact that Susanna very conveniently brought up uh, the issue of unilateral <laughs> measures. Uh, one of the demands that comes from Washington as to sort of signing up to the OECD deal is that uh, countries around the world r roll back their, nat uh, their, their national uh, digital taxes. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, you know, are you cool with that? Well, um, this is a very good question indeed, and the point is uh, is really, uh, I mean, high on the political agenda right now, both for uh, Europeans but also for the US. Um, I think the G7 statement, um, the recent G7 statement, makes clear that uh, we, we will need coordination between uh, the implementation of future Pillar 1 agreement uh, and the removal of uh, existing uh, DST where there exists. I think France has always uh, also been very clear on the fact that our national DST uh, was an interim uh, measure. Um, so, yeah, I would, uh, th th that would be my, my uh, response. Okay, good. That was nicely tiptoed around. I appreciate that. Uh, what, one of the things that is meant to be less interim uh, is the, the EU's plans to introduce a uh, digital levy. Now, I, I know that uh, there isn't much to say about it right now because obviously we're waiting on first the OECD to come up with uh, an actual... Um, uh, agreements that the G20 can sign off on, uh, and whatever comes out of this digital levy will obviously depend on, on what happens there. What I find interesting is that the Washington have also been very, you know, critical or skeptical about uh, the EU's plans for this uh, digital levy. And, and so, Claire, I'd like to come back to you just very quickly on this. Um, I mean, do you worry that Washington might then torpedo uh, the EU's plans to introduce a digital levy as well? Well, um, first, I appreciate you focusing on me to answer this uh, very uh, de delicate uh, question. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, indeed, uh, I mean, I, I would be, uh, I think it is, uh, uh, it is prudent uh, for me to be very cautious on this question because, uh, well, this is uh, one of the issues which is uh, currently being discussed um, at the uh, international level. Uh, so I think... And I, I don't speak for the Commission, of course, but I, I think we trust the Commission to be, uh, you know, to issue um, uh, a proposal on own resources, which would, which will be consistent with the state of uh, the current international ongoing discussion. And as you know, the, the situation is fluid, so I don't think we can be very uh, much more precise than that at this stage. Fair enough. Uh, Susanna, you, you don't have to be as careful uh, as other members uh, here. Uh, come on, have at it. Tell me what you think about uh, the digital levy. Well, I think the European Commission uh, has the task to do possible the impossible at this moment. And we get you good luck. <laughs> um, but I mean, when you read the, the G7 communique, it's clear and it's quite said in capital letters that uh, the deal comes together with uh, commitment from all countries to remove unilateral measures. And unilateral measures have 
apparently a big thing. We are not in the room, so it will uh, depends on how the, those, the, the final discussions are made. But it's uh, all those uh, digital sales tax in uh, European countries, but also the alternative solution that has been adopted by countries like the equalization uh, uh, levy in, in India or uh, countries, smaller countries like Uruguay that have been uh, more in, in the way of uh, withholding taxes. So, um, for us, I mean, the idea of the, the uh, of uh, digital levy is quite interesting. One, because as I was saying at the beginning, Pillar One is so limited; it's a, it's a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the global uh, profit. So, any idea that could be still uh, bringing revenues from uh, the digital activity from companies that are still paying very low, uh, below the fair uh, the fair share would be possible. How the European Commission is going to navigate uh, <laughs> the commitment to remove unilateral measures and at the same time developing something that is compatible to us? I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting to see how you think in the creativity, but it, anyway, in the end, it's nothing else that the uh, sales tax, maybe, and even the US and other countries have this kind of tax. So probably it's, uh, it's uh, being creative in the way it's going to be designed and not targeted only to some uh, companies. But we see uh, this as a good way to compensate the limit uh, of uh, Pillar 1. Yeah. Okay, well, plenty of luck uh, directed at the Commission for that. Um, one, one initiative which has been uh, dived into a little bit more uh, in, in, in May was this, uh, just so I remember the full acronym here, uh, Business in Europe, colon, Framework for Income Taxation, or the cooler way of saying it, BFIT. Uh, I'm, uh, th this is something which, uh, it's an interesting uh, concept, but, but I'm not the one necessarily to sit here and explain it properly. Uh, Benjamin, could, could you just give us a sense of what it is that the Commission hopes to do? Sure. We, we have been discussing for a very long time uh, the CCTB and then the CCCTB. It's been a decade of discussion on the framework for uh, businesses in Europe. So this discussion, unfortunately, have gone nowhere and the uh, text is completely uh, in, uh, in a stage of uh, brain death in, in council with uh, no, no hope of resurrection. So we have to turn this page. And the Commission has announced its intention to withdraw the CCCTB. But we have, at the same time, not lost our ambition to facilitate the uh, life of businesses in Europe and to build a system that is up to the challenges of our single market. And we feel that the uh, international agreement, which is uh, being finalized in the OECD, will offer an opportunity to kickstart on a new basis this discussion. When we have an agreement on Pillar 1, we have an agreement on an approach on how to share a taxable base and a formula. When we have an agreement on Pillar 2, we have an agreement on a common way to um, assess the tax base. Those two elements, though defined differently, were the two fundamental features of the CCCTB. So our very simple idea is let's turn the page of the CCTB and build instead on what our member state will have agreed internationally with Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, use it as a basis and see if we can construct something broader and more ambitious and more simple for the European among themselves. That is, we're not trying to uh, impose rules to the rest of the world. We're really talking of territorial rules, not extraterritorial rules. Um, but that would make the life of our multinational easier. Mm -hmm. If you're asking me whether uh, we have all the fine prints, we don't. And I don't think it would be sound for the Commission to cook in isolation in an ivory tower, a large plan on what to do. Uh, out of this international agreement and how to construct BFIT. So we will start as of the autumn consultation with a stakeholder, with a business association, and more important, with a member state. And we will do a systematic effort to try to approximate in common what would be needed and what we should table to have a tax system which is more modern and more efficient. That cannot be done by us in isolation. It has to be a collective effort, and that will be our top priority for next year. 
Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, Claire, I'll, I'll move to you. Just, just before I ask you a little bit about the dynamics in, in Council on tax files, just, it's, it's obviously fair to ask you first, uh, what's the French position on, on the idea that uh, with the BFIT proposal or framework that we're, we can envision? Well, of course, we are a strong supporter of the initiative. Um, we basically think that, uh, well, we, we basically see that there is a strong demand from business uh, to simplify and unify the taxation rules in the EU uh, for uh, European businesses uh, doing cross-border business, which is a, a huge part of our companies. Uh, it is still, uh, you know, uh, uh, cumbersome to have to, to, to deal with uh, 27 uh, very different uh, set of tax rules. So uh, everything that can go into uh, the direction of uh, simplification and uh, harmonization uh, is welcome uh, from our side. Uh, we've always been strong supporter of that and we, don't, uh, we haven't changed our uh, position. I mean, you, you get to sit in, in uh, the council where... Uh what we need in order to pass tax laws is unanimity. Uh, you've seen how countries have reacted to the uh, consolidated common corporate tax base, uh, the CCCTB that Benjamin uh, mentioned before. Uh, I mean, is, is there a risk that we kind of end up here anyway, even if people sign up to a pillar one agreement at the OECD? Well, I mean, you know, uh, unanimity uh, is always uh, more difficult uh, to get to, to an agreement. At the same time, uh, it is also the guarantee that, uh, uh, well, we, we do have a strong support and it is very important, uh, especially on, on fiscal, uh, on taxation uh, rules, because, it, I mean, it is the, really the core of uh, uh, the capacity of the state uh, to, to, to raise revenue and to do things with those uh, revenues mm -hmm. in the interest of, of the people. So, I mean, there is a, a reason behind the fact that uh, we have uh, uh, rules uh, in the Council. Um, I, I think, uh, well, of course, I would not deny the fact that uh, it's, uh, it has been difficult over the, the past years uh, to, to make progress. It is also fair to say that we have managed to come to agreements, even with the unanimity rules, on uh, various texts. Mm -hmm. And I do think, I do believe that, you know, the, 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 new, um, uh, the, the, the new impetus uh, that has been um, uh, provided by the way the international debate on taxation uh, is moving, changes a lot of things, in fact, uh, and might also change the dynamics in the Council um, uh, to, to make progress on fiscal, uh, on taxation, sorry, uh, on taxation issues. Uh, so, I mean, let's see. I think the Commission has taken a very uh, a wise decision to, to take back some texts which, on which we have been trying without succeeding uh, for a, a long time. And, you know, to start from scratch and see what, what can be done again in this new uh, in this new international very positive atmosphere mm -hmm. around uh, taxation Great. Uh, thank you, Claire. Suzanne, I'm, I'm going to move to you here. I mean, as, as Benjamin said, you know, we haven't actually come out with any firm blueprints yet. This is, uh, you know, an intent of something that will come. Uh, you have now your chance to draw up your wish list and hand it directly to Benjamin here. Uh, what, what is it that you'd like to, to ask of him? Well, I would leave it long, Benjamin, now that. Uh, um, but when I hear that it's going to be broader, more ambitious and simple, it's just what we are asking for. I mean, it's broader, we think it's going to be all the profits, uh, at least within the European uh, territory for all uh, European companies below the 700 million uh, turnover threshold. That's a good, uh, good music for, uh, for our year. It's more ambitious also on the, on the way it's going to be designed and also fair. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the reallocation uh, key, I mean, it's not going to be only based on sales, but a more balanced understanding on how the European business is, uh, uh, is taking place within the European territory, including other elements like assets and, um, and, uh, and uh, job creation. Then it's also good news. What we want is exactly that. I mean, more ambitious in terms of the scope activity in the, below the lower the, the threshold and also uh, more ambitious in terms of uh, unfair in terms of uh, the distribution. Uh, if that happening, I think that will be able also to compensate, again, I must say, the limitations of the pillar one. 
And again, how the European Commission is going to build consensus while the European countries have not been uh, uh, keen to, do, to this consensus at the OECD? It's again uh, a lot of work uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the European Commission. We've got a, a little bit of an impossible question in from one, one member of our audience, from uh, Nico Heyer, uh, and I'll, I'll put it to all of you, given the fact that I can imagine it might be quite uh, a short answer. But uh, in terms of BFIT, the question here from Nico is, how would Luxembourg ever vote for something like this? Uh, Susanna, I'll start with you, and then I'll make my way through Claire and then Benjamin before we move on to the next subject. Well, based on what Luxembourg has been voting so far, I would say no. Claire? Well, um, th this is a very tricky question and it should be asked to Luxembourg, but uh, you should never underestimate uh, the, the price Luxembourg pay uh, p attach to uh, uh, European integration and the European Union. So they are uh, great believers in, in this whole process and uh, it can help at some point to find compromise. And Benjamin? Yes, if, if someone had asked 20 years ago whether Luxembourg would have accepted, for instance, to have public register of beneficial ownership, to have full transparency on bank accounts and stuff like this, people would have said not in a million years. And then, and yet they have accepted. So I, I fully agree with Claire that the Luxembourg of today is not the one it used to be. And that there is uh, uh, a, a real willingness to uh, improve the, the tax governance in almost all member states. Uh, despite unanimity, we had in the previous commission more than 20 tax directives adopted. And they were adopted mm. even uh, in an EU28 framework. Mm. So it shows you that um, the, 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 the other rules remain very complex and certainly uh, more complex than we would hope, uh, we can still get there when there is a strong political will. And if we have this international agreement, and if we manage to transpose it successfully, and we think we will, we have something we can build on and something that is a solid base for a future common construction. Great. Uh, Susan, I'm going to come back to you here. I mean, you know, to, to uh, other panelists' points, I mean, we've managed to introduce a lot of uh, directives on taxation uh, in, in recent years. Um, now, officially, the EU says that there is no such thing as the tax haven uh, within the European Union. Um, and just to sort of get us into the next subject here, I'm just wondering, you know, do you agree with that statement? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, we've been saying that uh, one of the <laughs> no, and, and um, I mean, I it's, it's we've been saying high and low that uh, there are tax havens at the head of the European uh, 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 the European Union, and they are playing a very negative uh, spillover effect on the rest of European uh, countries. Also, and even the European Commission has been recognizing that uh, at the European semester, recognizing some of those aggressive tax practices. Not to say the, the, the statement also from the European Parliament naming some of those countries. It's clear that it's not only a matter of transparency, it's also a matter of uh, uh, fairness and those uh, aggressivity, those tax uh, practices. But especially at this moment, I mean, Europe, I mean, we're talking about a fair recovery. We're going through a very tough time for many countries and many European citizens. We can build Europe based on still tax competition. And this is the big elephant in the room when we are talking about uh, any kind of tax uh, reform at the European level, we still have this level of uh, aggressivity, or this level of competition between European uh, countries. It's impossible that we build uh, a federal recovery based on, on that. And the European Commission has been putting in place some mechanisms in working also with the blacklist and other process to try to counter that, but it's still uh, one of the issues that it's uh, remaining uh, as a problem for the rest of European countries. So we, we don't have uh, officially uh, EU tax havens uh, across the block, but there's one thing uh, that the Commission uh, has said is that, that it's looking into possible uh, fiscal practices that uh, undermine the, the single market. Um, and uh, part of this would trigger a clause called Article 116 that would allow uh, countries to introduce initiatives through a qualified majority voting system. Um, this is something that, that you're, you're working on at the moment, Benjamin. Uh, can you tell us uh, anything more about that? 
Well, first one, one point in general, we, we are not against tax competition. It is normal to have um, some tax competition between member states. The social models are different. The priorities are different. What we are up against is harmful tax competition. That is measures that seek to uh, artificially uh, attract investment or move economic activity from one country to another. We have a code of conduct in place for many years, since 1997. Uh, this code of conduct has delivered good results and has allowed to dismantle a very high number of harmful tax regime. It is a bit losing traction at the moment, and that's the reason why last year the Commission has proposed to reform the code of conduct and to broaden its mandate and scope. And we are still in discussion with member states on how to do it. We are uh, making good progress, and we are resolutely confident that an agreement should be possible this year. Uh, you referred, Bjark, uh, to an article of the treaty that allows indeed to uh, dismantle uh, via uh, the ordinary legislative procedure some possible uh, harmful domestic measures. Uh, we uh, are indeed uh, looking into it. Uh, we have uh, identified some possibilities. It's uh, an article which has never been used uh, since the treaty exists, but no one is an opting out to it at the same time. So the article is there. Um, this article puts a large burden on us because to be able to use it, we need also to uh, demonstrate that uh, uh, tax regime, which is identified as potentially problematic, is creating distortion in the single market. So we have to do the economics right, and that takes some time. And it will be uh, up to the, the president and the commissioner, obviously, to uh, decide when uh, and if uh, we should go out with a concrete proposal. Uh, Claire, I'll, I'll just move it to, to you very quickly on this, um, given the fact that we're running out of time. It, what, what do you believe the commission should target uh, with, with Article 116? Well, obviously, uh, well, this is not uh, up to me to say. This is a choice uh, that the Commission can make, as uh, Benjamin has explained. France doesn't have uh, a position. After having demonstrated, well, we, we, I don't think we have made the analysis um, at this point, um, okay. and uh, it's good that we have that in our panel of instruments. Um, and it's uh, also uh, good that the Commission is prudent in the way it uses it, uh, because uh, well, it, it needs to be uh, uh, sound from a legal legal perspective, um, and the treaty is uh, quite uh, uh, precise in uh, what should be uh, assessed before using the instrument. But we well, we, we we do think that this is something that could be used. Uh, it is uh, totally legitimate. Great. Thank you with that. Uh, and unfortunately, we've run out of time, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank our panelists very much, uh, Claire, Benjamin and Susanna. Thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, we're going to uh, very quickly have a look at the poll, uh, which, as just to remind you all, uh, which tax in initiative will be implemented by the end of 2022. We're talking about the digital levy, uh, carbon border tax and energy taxation, or none of them. Uh, we should have results uh, at some point. Let's have a very quick look to see if I'm updated it here. Uh, in fact, it, it looks like the, the majority of people think at 57% that that'll be the carbon border tax. Uh, <laughs> second will be none of them. Uh, third would be energy taxation. And uh, last would be digital levy. So we do wish uh, the Commission the very best of luck on, on that one uh, at the end of the day. Uh, join me in about 10 minutes uh, for our last session of the summit which is an exclusive interview uh, with none other than the newly appointed OECD Secretary General, Matthias Kormann, uh, during which we'll be able to discuss further the themes that we've just mentioned on this panel. So please stay tuned for that. Thank you all very much. <laughs>